I'm going to run through some of the posters, but there's a wealth of information included in the poster session, so please make sure that you go through those. So let's start by looking at a long-term safety and efficacy study, looking at 1% class quarterone cream. And this was studied in patients age 9 and up, and this long-term extension study occurred after the three-month phase 3 clinical trial. So after the three months, when we look at who came into this study, the vast majority of them had almost clear, mild, or moderate disease, and notice that we're now evaluating not only the face, but also the truncal acne. And what we found was, as patients continued to use the medication in the open-label study over the course of the additional nine months, we saw continued efficacy in the facial acne. And we found that those patients who started on class quarterone in the phase three studies and continued on it tended to have better efficacy over time. We also found that this was quite efficacious on the trunk as well, and those patients continued to improve over the course of the additional nine months. We also did not find any new safety signals in the long-term trial. So let's move on to our next poster, and this is Depineroff Cream 1%. I spoke about this yesterday for plaque psoriasis, but it's currently in phase three clinical trials for atopic dermatitis, and we're studying it in children as well as adults. Remember that uh, Tepineroff is a molecule that works inside the cell. It binds to the RO hydrocarbon receptor, and it's an agonist, and we see that it downregulates inflammation, it reduces oxidative stress, and it normalizes the skin barrier. And we see a reduction of those type 2 cytokines that we see which are elevated in atopic dermatitis. The structure of this trial is studying patients down to age 2. We're looking at patients with moderate disease or worse with 5 to 35 percent body surface area. Two sister studies are being conducted, patients either on active drug, and for every two on active drug, one is treated with vehicle, and they're treating every day for eight weeks. We also will continue to these, study these patients in a long-term open-label study where patients will go off drug if they get to completely clear skin, and we'll again look to see if we have a durable remittive effect. The next poster looks at trelakinumab, and you know that this biologic has been FDA approved for moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. But when we do these clinical trials, we have a really high bar. We're looking for these moderate to severe patients to get all the way to clear or almost clear in a limited period of just 16 weeks. But what about everybody else? Does everybody, does anybody have any meaningful results that aren't exactly that very high bar? Well, in this study, we actually looked at other important endpoints, including an easy 50 and we found that at least a third of the patients with that very strict statistical analysis get at least an, an easy 50. We find that when we look for the itch score to improve three rather than four grades, we see about another quarter of patients getting that reduction of itch. And then finally, when we look at the Dermatology Life Quality Index and ask how many patients have a four-point reduction over the course of the 16 weeks, we find almost 50%. So there's a lot of important assessments that are done that aren't that high bar of treatment success, but still very meaningful improvements for the patient. And when we put all of these assessments together, in these patients who didn't, weren't the defined treatment success, it turns out that about half of them have at least one of these important other characteristics. And it turns out that 29% of these patients actually have all of these characteristics. They have all of these important improvements. And this is statistically better than those patients who were just on the placebo. Now, this is a really interesting study. This asks the question that everybody wants to know. In those patients who are getting trelokinumab, who had prior dupilumab treatment, what happens? So this was a study using trelo with topical corticosteroids in patients with severe atopic dermatitis, and this is their EXTRA-7 trial. And this is a subgroup analysis. So in this study, they were treated with either active drug and topical steroids or placebo and topical steroids, treated over the course of 16 to 26 weeks, and then a safety follow-up. And these were adult patients. 
Now, what's interesting is there were patients who had had prior dupilumab treatment. And in the active group, there were six patients. In the placebo group, there were eight patients. And we followed these patients to see what happens when they're now treated with tralokinumab. And what we found was actually quite interesting. All six of those patients achieved an easy 75, which was better than those on the placebo. Two-thirds of them got to clear or almost clear, again, or again, better than those on the placebo. And half of them achieved that four-point reduction of itch. And these improvements continued from 16 through 26 weeks. It's also important to note that the safety profile was actually quite good in these patients. There were no serious adverse events. Now, two patients who were in this trial had conjunctivitis with dupilumab and did not have conjunctivitis with, with Trelo. There was one case of a patient who did develop conjunctivitis who had not had it with dupilumab. So what about long-term assessments? We now have tralokinumab data for three years. What does the efficacy look like? What does the itch? What does the quality of life look like over a long period of time? So the extra one and two studies followed patients for a year, but then we have a long-term study that follows for an additional two years. So now we have three years' worth of information that we can study for these patients. And what we found was, first of all, when we look at the easy score or the efficacy over time, we see a very nice, stable improvement over the course of the three years. When we look at the easy 75 and we look at it with different statistical analyses, even with the strictest, the modified NRI, about 86% of patients continue to have an easy 75, and over half of them continue to have an easy 90. So patients are maintaining the results very nicely over the course of several years. What about the other parameters that were assessed? What about itch and sleep and quality of life? And for each one of these, we found meaningful improvements that lasted over the course of the three years. What about safety signals? Well, we now have this study. We have studied this drug for year after year after year, and the important thing was that the safety profile is favorable, and we're not seeing any new safety signals as these patients are using this drug over extended periods of time. So let's switch gears and talk about a new drug that's not yet FDA approved, Ducravacidinib. This drug is a unique mechanism of action in that it's an oral TIC2 inhibitor. It was also studied in patients who had moderate to severe plaque psoriasis. And in these studies, we actually looked at patients who, in one arm, were treated with a premolast and then transitioned over to Ducravacidinib. So the question asked in this poster is, what happened to those patients who didn't do well with the premolas and then were put on ducravacidinib? How did they do? So the design of this study is actually a really nice one. It's a three-arm study initially. People are either on active drug or placebo or on an active comparator, which is a premolas. Then, after 24 weeks, in patients who were not considered a treatment success on a premolas, they were then transitioned to active ducravacidinib. So in study one, they had to achieve a PASI 50 to stay on a premolas. Under a PASI 50, they went on ducravacidinib. In study two, they had to achieve a, a PASI 75 to stay on drug. Under that, they went to ducravacidinib. So we're really asking, what happens to this arm? If these patients didn't do well on a premolas, are they now going to do well on ducravacidinib? So what we found was in these treatment failures, if you put them on ducravacidinib, almost half of them are going to achieve a PASI 75, 46% in the first study, 42% in, in the second study. What about a high bar of getting a clear or almost clear response? Again, a lot of these patients, 42% got to clear or almost clear in the first study and 27% in the second study. So this drug can work even in patients who don't do well on a premolas. What about asking, well, how about the impact on quality of life? How many patients are getting to a zero or one, which means their disease no longer has any impact on their quality of life? We're seeing about a quarter of those patients who did not respond to a premolas now are getting to a DLQI score of zero or one. 
So we also studied ducravacidinib in some of the special areas, including the scalp, the nails, and the palmar plantar psoriasis. So this is a subset analysis in the main phase three clinical trial, the two studies. So reminding you again of the study design, three arms of the study. The study went for a total of 52 weeks, so we have a year long's worth of data. So first, let's take a look at scalp. How many patients are getting to clear, or almost clear of their scalp psoriasis on ducravacidinib? And we're seeing almost two thirds of them after 16 weeks, and we're seeing a maintenance of that response up to about 70% of patients over the course of the year will see clear or almost clear of their scalp psoriasis. What about fingernails? Well, to look at fingernails after 16 weeks, chances are the nail is not gonna grow out in 16 weeks. We know it can take six months, nine months, 12 months to see those nails grow out. So after 16 weeks, we saw 20% of patients getting to clear or almost clear of their nail disease but look at after 52 weeks, about half of those patients are clear, almost clear of the psoriasis of the nails, and that can be very challenging to treat. And what about psoriasis of the palms and soles? We actually saw a very nice response. Up to half of these patients got to clear, almost clear of their palms or soles on active drug at week 16, and we saw continued improvement up to about 56% over the course of the entire year. We also have some long-term safety data on ducravacidinib. We actually have up to two years' worth of safety data. So we've already seen what happens in the first phase three clinical trials, and these trials went for an entire year. Then these patients go on to active drug. Everybody gets six milligrams once a day, and we're following these patients for year after year, and at this point, we have an additional one year worth of data that we'll take a look at. So when we look at the adverse reactions, what we're looking at is the, the number of patients or the number of, of events per 100 patient years. So we're really trying to normalize the data so they can be actually compared one number to the next. So here we're looking at the numbers at one year and then we're also looking at the numbers at the end of two years. So it's nice to look at this particular number here because this is the normalized results per 100 patient years. So we see the AEs at one year were 229 per 100 patient years. At the end of two years, that number goes down. The SAEs go up a little bit, and most of this is due to the fact that the long-term study was right conducted at the height of COVID. So we have a lot of COVID cases put in there. But when we look at the others, and you can see here the COVID went from 0.5 to 5.1. But other AEs generally go down with the course of time. When we look more specifically at some of the AEs of interest, we see serious infections. We have COVID mixed in with that. When we look at herpes zoster, which was signaling a little bit with, uh, with any of the oral JAK inhibitors, but here very mild, and we're actually not seeing an increase with time. COVID-19, as I mentioned, went up because this study was at the height of the COVID infection, but others are really stable. We're not seeing an increase in MACE events, VTE, or an increase in malignancies over time. And in terms of efficacy, what are we seeing as we use this drug over the course of the long term? We're actually seeing consistent efficacy results, whether they were on ducravacidinib from the beginning, whether they were transitioned over from placebo or transitioned from a, a premolas. We're seeing consistent, nice results in PASI 75, PASI 90, as well as clear or almost clear. Now we're going to take a look back at Tepinarov 1% cream. As I mentioned, it's already been FDA approved for plaque psoriasis. Now we're going to look at the breakdown in uh, disease characteristics and demographics and see does the drug work for different types of patients. So the way this study was conducted, two phase three clinical trials, active drug versus vehicle in adult patients who had mild, moderate, or severe um, in terms of their physician's global assessment, three to 20% body surface area, treating every day for 12 weeks. And this is really interesting because we look at the different characteristics. So the first line 
is the baseline physician's global assessment. And we see whether you had moderate disease or severe disease, this drug worked well, even in those severe cases where they had to jump three or four categories to get to be a treatment success. It can be tough to be a success for mild disease because even if they have a little bit of pink skin residual, that's not considered a treatment success. But look at BSA. Here we look at patients who had less than 10% or greater than 10%. And by definition, these patients are candidates for systemic therapy. And we can say, if you have 10 to 20% body surface area, there's a good likelihood that you might get to clear or almost clear with just a topical cream. Duration of disease didn't matter, sex didn't matter, age didn't matter, race or country. It seemed to work across all of these different aspects. Here's an example of a patient with moderate disease at baseline. They went to a mild at week four and an almost clear by week 12 with a nice improvement in just their clinical response. Now we're gonna take a look at the fixed combination of calcipatrine and betamethasone dipropionate. It's available as a cream which utilizes pad technology. We saw enhanced penetration with pad technology, but also a very elegant cream. This was a patient preference study where they asked patients, do you prefer the cream fixed combination or the foam fixed combination? And the foam, the same calcipatrine betamethasone dipropionate. And what we found was patients treated both the non-scalp and the scalp areas, they actually preferred the foam formulation over, I'm sorry, they preferred the cream formulation over the foam formulation, whether they were evaluating treatment on the body or on the scalp. And then we'll take a look at a real world tildrakizumab study. These are patients with moderate to severe psoriasis. It's a real world study looking at safety and quality of life. Looking at the baseline characteristics, pretty much what we see in clinical trials, these patients were, majority were white, around the age of 50, um, fairly evenly split male versus female, and their DLQI score is pretty high. It's a nine, which is almost a significant um, impact on their quality of life. Their body surface area is around a 15% at baseline. And what we found was, when we look at the DLQI score over time, it went from a nine down to a 1.7. So it went from a significant impact to a very minor impact on their overall quality of life. And when we looked at how many patients had that zero or one for their DLQI score, over a half of them with this real world study. Now looking at the body surface area over time, we went from around a 15 down to about a three over the course of uh, 28 weeks. And then when we look at the physician's global assessment, we went from a moderate down pretty much to a mild over course of time. And that basically concludes my kind of quick overview on some of the really interesting posters. This doesn't even touch all the posters that are available, so peruse through and I think you'll learn a lot. I did, thanks so much.